Good morning, Bitcoin. My name is Thomas Hunt, and this is Proof of Work. Proof of Work is a show about the people behind Bitcoin and NFTs, what they do, and how they got here. Today, our guest is Threesomes, NFT artist. How's it going, Threesomes? It's going very well. Thank you. I'm, I'm out here in LA today, uh, recovering from a night out with the crazies for NFT LA. So uh, a little rough for wear, but but hanging in there. Excellent. And we're just going to get started with everyone's most favorite and familiar question. What was your first computer? I actually have an answer for this very simply. Uh, Commodore 64 was my first. Um, and uh, I it's, uh, had a major love affair with that machine. Fantastic. A classic first computer. What kind of stuff did you guys do with the Commodore? Uh, I actually... By the time I was five and six, I was I was coding a, a decent little amount. Um, uh, I had a, a godfather that introduced me to all of this, um, and a little little tiny backstory. I didn't have running water or electricity at the time, so I owned this machine that I would take with me uh, to go visit people who had electricity, <laughs> and so I would take take it with me and, and teach them how to connect it to their their TV, and then you know walk them through stuff. But um, I mean, obviously, like most most people that that era, we started with gaming and stuff. But um, in, within a couple of years, my, my godfather taught me a bit about coding, so I, I could write some elementary stuff. Um, and uh, what but, kind of stuff you were coding it was all like uh, basic programs, like kind of yeah, printing stuff, programs, variables. Yeah. The, the the one that I was uh, really into was was uh, I had one that was a lawnmower. Uh, the cursor would just run across the screen, uh, and you would mow the lawn. Which I grew up in the desert, so lawns were like fantasy land to me. So it, it was that's uh, awesome. You were able to make like a, a kind of a functional game. I know I had one where it just kind of blinked the telephone on and off, and I'd drawn an ASCII telephone, and it made ring ring sounds. Uh, exactly. But that was that was a lot for basic. You know, that was a lot of like this line, right. that line, and you're drawing the ASCII image yourself every single square. Uh, so that's pretty cool. You were able to make a game or something functional out of it. Yeah. No, I mean there was there it was not a very complex game, but it was uh, you know for for my age it was pretty good. And that was and that was sort of the peak of my developing. Uh, it wasn't like this tells the story of me going on to being a great programmer. No, by any means, I, I sort of at six or seven was the the golden era of my coding skills. Well, and it's not like our parents saw it for anything at the time. They're like, you're just wasting time on the computer. If you're programming, if you're on BBSs, if you're making art, the same kind of thing. They're like, that's video games. That's a waste of time. You need to do something serious, like read a book, right? Well, the thing is, most of my life was doing very serious book reading. Um, so honestly, I, I, there's some support I got. I, my, my mother was fine with, with my uh, my interest in it. And, you know, she wasn't fine with providing electricity for us. Uh, but so, <laughs> she wasn't going to go that extra mile. But but no, it was uh, I was supportive. I, I never felt like uh, it was dismissed at all. I just quickly became a, a too good of a baseball player to keep doing things like that. So. I took my life a different direction. So you became a baseball player. So that's that's where the roots of this NFT baseball card art come from. So how how'd you do it? Baseball? Were you a high school baseball player? Maybe college? I, I was a high school baseball player. I was a college baseball player. I played professionally as well. So um, yeah, no, I I, I had a a, a a young you know, bit of a career, um, but I spent my most of my twenties outside of baseball. Uh, and then eventually I went back and I ran a, a franchise. I ran a minor league franchise for a bit in my 30s. So, well, that, that sounds fantastic. I can't help but think of uh, Bull Durham and all the kind of like major league movies I've watched. Was it anything like that? Oh, I mean, quite honestly, Bull Durham is, is uh, the most spot on uh, portrayal of life in baseball. Uh, it's a little different now. I mean, things have evolved a bit. But if you go back, especially my age, uh, I, I grew up watching Bull Durham to the extent of I, I had cassette audio cassette recordings of certain scenes that I would play in my headphones on the way to games. Um, I know it li line by line and, and it, I, I ended up living that lifestyle. It's pretty cool. No, it's pretty awesome. It's a great movie and it, it gets better and better the older you got. I mean, I watched it when I was young and lots of things I didn't understand. And I get older and older, especially the, the scene where he's going through the baseball cliches. He's like, yeah, I just want to win one for the team, you know, go out there, do our best. You know, it's so exactly. classic. It goes forever. Oh, then. no, no. It, it really, 
uh, it's it's been a big part of my life. That movie is so spot on. Uh, and you're right. You, you know, to watch it when you're younger, and to grow into it over time, it, it just does get better and better. So, a lot of my projects sort of centers around that sort of uh, mentality. So, how did you go from baseball and even running your own franchise to getting involved in Bitcoin and NFTs? Was it even Bitcoin first? It was not Bitcoin first. Um, it, it, I, I was aware of Bitcoin. I, I, I had friends that were involved in Bitcoin um, back in you know thirteen, and uh, actually did a bit of work with people who, who were setting the first Bitcoin ATMs back in in twelve and thirteen, right? Um, and, the, and and so I was I was peripheral to it, but it didn't really do it for me at the time, right? It did I, one of those things where I have the regrets of not having bought as much as I could at twenty dollars, right? Sometimes it, it doesn't shine right away. I know I I was excited about it. I told my roommate, he was a programmer. He was like, eh, I don't see it, and it just drifts to your back of your mind. And other people I knew were into it, but unless someone just sits there in front of the computer and says, "Hey, this is important. Pay attention." You usually have to discover it on your own. It's usually that disaster story of, oh, I could have got it at this, and oh, I could have got oh, it. Oh, of course. That. Yeah, yeah. We we all have that at this point. I mean, I, I, um, I have a lot of those moments in my life even before Bitcoin. So I've gotten to that point that I don't really get hung up on it. I sort of try to move towards it. So at this point in my late thirties, early forties, I'd actually moved into painting. So I, I, painting became my main outlet and my main focus outside of my, my corporate career. And so uh, when I found myself really starting to amass a, a, a decent representation of my work, I, w I wasn't really sharing it with anybody yet. It was you know, the joke uh, in, in my collector group is that, that, you know, it was only women that slept with me got to see my paintings. Right. And that was that was true for a number of years. Uh, and then. It, NFTs came on the periphery for me, you know, back in in late mid to late twenty, right? Um, and so I started when I came into it. My my initial approach was that I was going to start a platform to give uh, uh, you know undiscovered and emerging artists a chance at. at, at minting nfts so I, it was hey, that I, was a long day i tried to do that too <laughs> yeah a lot of us i think we're going to do that but the, the idea for me was that was the way i was going to get my stuff out there because i didn't feel that that i was going to get it under a curated platform so i could do it myself and then i thought about it and i was like you know what <clears throat> i don't want to start a whole new career again i was actually at a point in my life where i was kind of going to shut down what had been my career for a while and and move into just painting so why not just produce nfts and out of that i, I became threesome so the, the work that i do was already i'd been doing it for a number of years uh laying out what would eventually become the collection and then that that whole collection was conceived when i was back when i was about nine years old um the idea of so so you'd always been drawing kind of baseball card type objects I didn't start painting at all until I was 40. I, I was I was busy doing other things as a as a, a young one, and so um, no, I I never I never painted. I never did that. But what I did is I conceived of a, you know, I lived in this isolated mountain area with no you know electricity and and in my lived in my head, didn't have neighbors or anything, and so I created a an alternate parallel universe of baseball, where whatever the teams that were playing were the their mascots so if you had the giants playing the tigers it was actual giant beings playing actual tigers and i thought that was just that was the way of the world that was how this should go and so now i get into my 40s i start painting and i actually started sort of building out sort of the way you talk about bull durham evolving between you know being 12 and 40 at 40 my concept of these alternate world teams where whatever the team was named what their mascot was is what they are became very different but i started painting out these teams of you know for example uh, the exes are one person's ex-boyfriends i imagined a, a team of baseball the entire baseball team where everybody on that team is the ex-boyfriend of one person which i thought was hilarious I think it's a it's a great idea that like giants versus tigers. I'd always thought about that, and like jets versus you know sharks, these kind of things. Right. It seems like an unfair matchup very frequently. Like the jets would just shoot the sharks down from you know flying around. They'd have no problem at all. There's no way a shark's going to score an offensive point on a jet. So 
You, you would think something like, but they're, they're all, there's always the other side of the coin on all of them. Every matchup, and this is the beauty of baseball, right? Is is you know you can be the speediest you know guy, but you still have to hit the curveball. You can be the strongest, biggest guy in the world, but you still have to be able to get on base, right? And so there there are checks and balances in baseball that I think play out in a world where yeah, the the Jets are are, are battling the Sharks. Well, I've got a Transformers background on my screen here. It could be an anthropomorphized jet, a human jet, uh, having trouble getting the bat around, even uh, despite his ability to fly. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that, and that's the thing. When you when you take it into the artistic world, you can start doing whatever you want. So, you know, I have uh, a number of teams that I've released uh, as NFTs over the, these last few years. Um that still are just we're sort of scratching the surface of the uh, broader project that we're laying out over time. But um, you know, I've got eight eight different fully fleshed out teams that that play and live in this universe that I've created. So, so did you mainly start making NFTs of your existing art, or did you start making new art that was specifically for the NFTs? So what I what I did is. Um, I had all these teams. I had. I still have teams completely painted that I haven't even minted yet, right? And I paint every day. But I decided to drop for my very first series. I created a new team and I painted them exclusively to to mint. And that team is called the NFTs. And they are at the time. If you go back to early twenty one, they were the biggest NFT artists in the space. Predominantly, those that were catching that major pump during the Nifty Gateway time after after the Beeple Run and stuff, and so, you know, you have Mad Dog Jones and 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 uh, Beeple has a card and and Dot Pigeon and, and whoever, and so I painted all of those sort of early stalwarts to the space, the ones that were you know Pack is the the uh, the Chase Award that if you collected all of them in the, in the first series, you got a. a, a card of pack and i painted him as a scratch off to be revealed to scratch to reveal his identity right so um so i, I did that so that that first team that i minted was actually conceived entirely to be nfts uh whereas a lot of the older stuff was was actually meant for um, um you know they, they were just a part of the narrative and overall so I think that's a great way to get into the community and to kind of get the attention of the other artists. And so you did the kind of card borders to them for people that are looking at the video. We've got kind of like the 1986 black tops border, some of the white borders ones. Uh, do you have a favorite year of baseball cards? Do you try to stick to a certain genre or era? So, so my favorite year is, is 1971 tops, which is what the, the, my favorite set of all time. Um, just aesthetically, I like the, it's a black border. Uh, I like the font that they used. I like the, the imagery, but you, just to be clear, these, uh, these are actual baseball cards that I paint on. So I take actual three and a half by two and a half inch vintage baseball cards. And then I use gouache paint and I completely rework them entirely. And so as a result, there are some sets that I particularly like to work with because I like the, 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 the overall aesthetic and design. But in the end of it, I'm telling a story. So I, I have a team of the NFTs, for example, and they, the oldest card in that set is from 1964, okay? And then the, the most recent would be in 1978, I believe. But in other series, I have 1989s, I've got 1953s. And, and so it, it's, it's not that one team is made up of all of those players. It's over the course of that franchise at different times. In 1964, there were these players. Some of them appear multiple times on multiple years. Uh, there's, there's some complexities here to, to what I've done. I'm, I'm, I'm nearing 1,500 mints altogether. Uh, across this is, I think this is a fantastic idea and really great for collectors. And it really shows all the different ways that an F NFT can be. Because you can just release them in series like you would a normal baseball card. And, and then they go, you know, they run out like the normal ones and they get more popular or less popular. People start buying the new ones. You can increase the numbers. You've got the teams as well as kind of the story of what's going on in the league. Maybe the, the Yankees win it all one year or the A's come back and, you know, this one and that one. I, I think there's a lot of room for variation here. And as you said, you can do this all on your own as a solo artist. You don't need a company or anything to handle all these mints. Right. I, I mean, I've, I've, I had a Nifty Gateway drop um, at my one-year anniversary of minting, um, which was more of a nod for my collectors, just a, a bit of validation for them having a, a big solo Nifty drop. But, but honestly, uh, I'm I'm 
not all of my sort of chain agnostic. I'm certainly platform agnostic. I don't, I, I actually handle all of my own primary. Um, the, the bulk of my mints, I've, I've minted on, on counterparty. I mean, I, I you know, I've, I've, I, I have counterparty pieces. Uh, I was asked uh, to, to uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but I was brought into a project there just for the artwork. Um, but I have everything from ETH pieces, the big part of my projects on ETH, uh, to counterparty. And then, of course, Tezos is my main minting platform because it's a beautiful level two that allows me for no gas fees or anything. So I could, I, I, not only do I create all of these, but I have my collectors interact with them a lot. So we're, for example, two weeks ago, we had our most recent open edition. I sold 340,000 editions of it. And within the first week, we'd burned away 40,000 of them. And so I, I run some pretty major burn mechanics um, to, uh, to move the collection along and move the narrative along. And so to do that, the, the gas fees on Ethereum would be, even, even after the merge, even going down to 6 and $12 gas, it's, that's ridiculous if I'm going to have somebody burn 1,000 pieces on a given day, right? And so um, we do it on Tezos. It costs us nothing, and and the bulk of the collection sits over there. But it interacts with the other chains. So my my Tezos collectors can qualify to to receive the the stuff on on Counterparty, and then they'll use that Counterparty to offset something on the ETH side. I, I really bring it all together with um, all of my chains, which is important to the, the broader collection. I, I think it would be easy for an artist to become kind of a chain maximalist and try to go for that angle. Uh, but I agree a lot more with what you've done here because you should, you as an artist should be trying to market to everyone on every chain. If there's ETH only collectors, they should try to get some of your pieces. If there's Tesla only collectors, get them to some of them. And like you said, with the burn mechanics and with wanting to do anything, some of the chains are more expensive. Uh, so it would make sense for you to have those options on the, the cheaper chains. Exactly. It, it, so, you know, we're, we're moving towards a, a bit of a standardization across all the platforms. I've, I've got some wonderful developers that, that run my smart contracts uh, on ETH and on Tez. I, I, I've been exclusively on my own contracts there. Um, and, you know, building it in to, to a real cohesive sort of collector community where one wallet is recognized on this chain can unlock into a different wallet sort of profile style um, becomes the key to it all. But allowing the the transactions to happen with no cost to the collector is huge and it's it's a big part of why no matter what i'll need to be on some sort of a gasless chain um, but i'm not married to any of them I, I i happen to be the basically the largest artist on the tezos chain in history if you take into account my primary i'm in the top three of, if, only my secondary gets counted uh, which puts me in the top three but my primary is all just you know internal it's all my stuff so um but yeah i, I even though i'm i'm sort of the Tezos guy, um, I'm, you know, I'm happy to go where the, the project needs to go as far as the chain is concerned. I mean, you know, I'm I, speaking to your chain. Um, well, I guess I can, some of my collectors, if you listen to this, I can give a little alpha, but we're working towards ordinals uh, for the entire project where I'm going to basically take everything that I've done and, and put it into ordinals uh, for posterity's sake and moving forward. I know that's a little bit div divisive on the Bitcoin side. There's two sides of whether that's that's something or not, but I do believe from the artist standpoint, it's a, it's a major step. So we'll be doing, doing that over the next coming weeks. It is an interesting idea if it does last forever or if it gets edited out or some kind of uh, rebellion against them. Uh, either way, it could be potential value and uh, no reason not to mint the stuff if you have it. Uh, it's interesting yeah. talking about um, being up on different chains. Uh, one of the ideas we used to talk about when we made Curio cards is the idea of binders and card binders and that you want the cards to look good in a certain order. And then as a, as a collector, part of the whole thing for me is looking at my cards. So I want a really nice way to flip through them, even if it's just a web page. Uh, like you were saying, if the users are on different chains, and I think it's fun for your collectors uh, to have to kind of chase you from chain to chain, to have to learn the new technology if they want to be that serious a collector. I mean, I'm into REM, so I would go to shows, I get the posters, I get the albums. If you're a really serious collector, you're going to get the Tezos and the Ethereum ones. You're going to spread it exactly. out. But what do you think about the idea of binders? And uh, are you going to have a thing where the users could link their, their purchases together? I think it'd be cool. I love it. And we're, we're in, we're in the process of building the back end of, of bringing the entire collection under one roof. So uh, when you come to, to 
our platform basically, which is, is in development right now, when you wallet connect and profile connect, you're able to see all of your pieces together and, and handle them for that exact reason as a collector would, which means you might want to display them by year, while as somebody else might want to display them by team, somebody else might want to display them by player, right, and allow you to sort of custom build your experience to look through them, because that is a big part of it, and it's it's why, I mean, I'm very uh, involved, let's say, over the over my lifetime in, in baseball cards and in collecting, right, and I wanted to bring that I wanted to bring my paintings into that, which is where blockchain was the perfect place to land, right? Instead of me having to build that platform and build all of that out, um, I was able to use the, the blockchain to do the majority of that as far as keeping track of who has each of my pieces and where they are and how many they have and how they moved around and everything. So once I take that part of it out of the equation, now it becomes you know, building and, and creating the pieces that the collectors want to have and letting and then giving them the tools to collect and trade. So we have, you know, community is really big to the project where, you know, traders can come in and say this, you know, I have extras of these. I'm looking to complete this series. And, and so it's a huge part of it. And platform and, and in the end comes out to to make that sort of a, a final package altogether. So well, it's I definitely I like that you think that way. These basic collector mechanics are some of these some of the ideas we were working on uh, when we started Curio Cards. Because when you're a kid, and you have a box of cards. You don't really know anything about them. You don't know if this one's rare or that one's valuable. Maybe when I was a kid, they had the the card book, uh, Beckett or Wizard or whatever. You could look up how valuable your cards was. Maybe get that idea. Um, but with these blockchain objects, or we used to call them blockchain collectibles, but NFTs, whatever you want to call them, uh, you can really look it up. You could find out there's exactly 300 of them, 50 of them were burnt, this guy's got 20 of them. Uh, it's amazing to have that information, and the uh, the cards never uh, get bent or destroyed. They're always in mint condition. You don't have to get them graded or anything. I thought there's just so many benefits to card collecting on the blockchain, and you know our project went up and down, but... It's amazing to see how you as an artist are able to leverage these tools uh, that were built afterwards. It's a great, well, great. So, I, I, I totally agree. And, and that was really the impetus of, of bringing this to blockchain. OK, but for me, and I'll go back to you talking about being a kid with your box of cards, right? Go back even further to when you would buy those packs of cards and think about it at our age when we're nine or whatever, 10 and going through, you would go to the drugstore, you buy your packet of 1986 tops, 1988 tops or whatever. You knew what the, the big card was that you were chasing. You know, in 1987, it was the Mark McGuire rookie. It was the Jose Canseco, right? You knew those are the ones. Especially in the Bay Area, especially. Right, in the exactly. Area. Yeah, right. So you'd open that pack. Okay, you're looking for Will Clark or a, or a Mark McGuire, right? And you would go through, and it would be junk, 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 junk. I got it. What that meant was, and as we collected, we had our little stack of the guys we chased or the ones that were valuable because Beckett told us they were or whatever, and we had a mountain of junk, of commons, right? I found myself at 40 after having gotten rid of my main collection as a kid. Not by choice, but it was, <laughs> I lost that collection, right? All of a sudden at 40, I find myself with 400,000 fucking baseball cards again, <laughs> right? And I'm like, what did I do? And so I started defacing them, or it was sort of a rebellion where I started painting on them. But as I, as, then I started building my own little world where all of a sudden all of them were valuable because I had painted all of them. And I imagined a world where there's no such thing as a common. Every threesomes, which is what I call my pieces, every threesomes has future utility. And so as such, if, if I, with that mindset and knowing the broader narrative that I'm putting out there, there is no card that's ever left behind. Every single, it's, there's, it's not a little stack of, oh, these are the expensive, valuable ones, and these are all trash. No, the trash will have their moment. And so I have these very complex utility mechanics and it, it's taken a while for the collectors to understand truly that every piece you can ever have, it might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but there will be a time when it fits into the great, greater puzzle. And all of a sudden that thing that, yes, there were 300 of these and there's only 30 of these, but all of a sudden at that moment, those 300 are so necessary to get to the next 30, right? That it, it, and so as a result of understanding that and building that in from day one, I've built a project that is 
one of the better examples of, of, of what an NFT can actually be. Um, as far as not just the, the keeping track of who has all of them, but when you, you know, on, on the ETH or test side, when I involve a smart contract that can actually evolve that piece over time based on other pieces you might have and the way they interact with each other, then build the community around it that can understand that and trade back and forth and, and, and buy and sell. I, it, it becomes quite the undertaking that so far, two and a half years in, really, really works. I mean, I've got. Well, and if you're if you're really dedicated to it, uh, we can geek out totally here. I can see it very easily where each player could have his own stat line, and if you've got averages for them, I used to play uh, like micro league baseball on the Apple II, and it was just lineups. It was just like Jackie oh, Robinson yeah. and Gil Hodges, and you'd have these players. My favorite was called baseball, baseball manager, but it was the yeah exact same, same thing. thing. I played yeah, it on, yeah. On, yeah. So so having that in mind, okay. I mean, this is the hard one. You know, when I do an interview for the first time, somebody's new to the project, first of all, getting to the point that I do just paint baseball cards, getting beyond that, which is sort of a stumbling block. But in the last, we're now coming up on a year since we started what we call franchise era. So we had eight, I painted these eight teams. We collected them. We traded them. Everybody knew them. Everybody, but everybody was just a player. A player in our world is where you collect and, and try to get the cards. Okay. Now we've been, because I run my own primary, we've been tracking since day one, essentially, their productivity at collecting my cards. So everything is, is based on what you have, how many you're willing to risk and put into the thing to see if you get the new one. So you have sort of a batting average of sort. You know how many hits, we call them hits, but how many times the wheel picks your name and says you get to buy on primary, right? So we keep track of all of this. Every player has its own stats. I started then guiding players into franchises, and then I revealed something that I've been planning since day one. But last May, I sold all eight of the original franchises, I sold them for $50,000 each. And eight individual collectors or groups of collectors came together to buy the franchises, which then they had all these players. We had a free agent draft, okay? Everybody, they, so everybody who plays on these teams is paid in our coin, which is the three penny, okay? They're paid a salary. They can use those three pennies to buy the pieces. Uh, that's the way that we, we, we sell our primary often. OK, um, and you're, you're you're either now a franchise owner, front office, meaning you're the general manager runs all of this and make sure who's, you know, who plays for you and who you're trading and what's all that or you're a player. OK, and so and now those franchises compete against each other. Every time I have a season drop, it's, you know, team NFTs against team monsters, team cat moms against team Cardinale, and they go against each other and. By winning seasons or winning weeks, they they qualify for new paintings that only the champions get, right? So we, I mean, and this is, we're now one year into that, but there are level upon level that we're we have to sort of learn. We got to give the you know I make the toolbox and one tool at a time we learn how to do them to make this whole thing work. But we're eight franchises into what will be twenty four, and we do a new franchise every year, so. Now, see, this is fantastic. People are always complaining about NFTs and they have no value and blah, blah, blah. You had the paintings, you had the ideas, you bring it forward. You've got all the kind of like baseball managers, baseball simulator options here. You're rolling out franchises. I'm sure the franchises are probably an NFT. They could send that around or whatever if they want to have a battle for who owns well, the franchise so, and so forth. Right, right. You, you, you could in theory, except everybody exists in my world at my pleasure. So I am the, the omnipotent God of the threesomes universe, right? So that you, you, they cannot transfer a franchise without league approval. The same way in any, any professional sports league, the Yankees cannot just sell themselves to Bono. If, right. If Bono from U2 says, I want to buy the Yankees. They can't just do that. They have to even, the even if Bono owns the NFT, we still don't have to acknowledge him as the, right. Exactly. Exactly. So in, in my world, the, there are two types of, of collectors. We have speculators who do not participate in the project, simply hold the pieces, okay? By them holding them, they actually are deflating the utility of those who do because we recognize a wallet which is in project and one that is out. And so if, if a, an NFT is out of project at this moment, now it could be sold back in, right? But if at this moment it's out of project, it sort of deflates that utility. We don't have to worry about it being claimed against whatever utility we have going on. Um, 
And so in that regard, you can play, you know, you can play where you're into this, you know, the value and the utility force of these cards that you have, or you can simply speculate on them by holding them, not being involved in this, not coming to listen to me five to six hours a week, as we, we, we do, you know, I do a lot of live broadcasts where we sort of walk through the week and what's going well, on. I, I was going to say, my next question was like, how did you advertise this? How did you find, because obviously I'm the right kind of person, baseball, NFT, I, I would have gotten into the project if I heard about it earlier, but how would you find these people? How did you find these, the fans? To buy this. Here's what I did. Here's what I did. That first series being the NFTs, I knew because I'm an artist myself and I'm vain myself, but I knew that these NFT artists were vain. And I knew that if I painted them, that they would tweet about it. And they did. And so the tweet from Dot Pigeon, the tweet from Beeple, the tweet from Fuck Render, the tweet from Mad Dog Jones made me sell out in seconds the first series. And and then, because of the mechanics that I had built in for the initial chase and this, my my first my 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 genesis, okay, the dot pigeon 001, which is the our that's our Nakamoto, that's our that's our rare Pepe Nakamoto, okay. There's only 21 of them in existence. One of them was burned away, um, and they sell now in the 10 to to 15 thousand dollar range, okay. I have and a picture it, of I have a picture of a pigeon, but I'm not sure if it's look, the correct pigeon. That's not that's not me. That's that's a, that's 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 a rare. So in our world, <laughs> that's a rare that's a rare PP, okay. It's not a rare Pepe. It's a rare people. That's that's an that's an homage piece. That's somebody that that made something referencing me, right? Um, but but the, but that's that's the background of the original dot pigeon. So the original dot pigeon, when it dropped, it was one tez, one tezos. Okay, three dollars and fourteen cents that day. Um, the last six months, about six, five or six of them were sold for over ten thousand, right? Um, and over ten thousand tezos, not even dollars. I mean, so. Uh, that's that's our that's the grail in my collection right now okay but what i'm getting at is within the first 10 days where i was minting the original series i had automatic sellouts they were automatically going for 30 60 100 200x and so that was it <laughs> i didn't need to advertise all of a sudden everybody who was collecting on tezos was trying to get my stuff uh, until about the, the 14th drop that I did, the bots and the scripts were so heavy that I took it all offline. And that's where we went to where I handled my own primary. And we got all of the, the bad actors out of it. And made I made people work and put in some effort to get my stuff. And so whether people, we, we joke that, that people came for the 100X and they stayed for the friends. Right. Um, but little by little, it was, it was very much word of mouth. And I kept it very clandestine for the first year until... Nifty approached me to do that drop, and I started doing some more interviews and appearances and stuff like that. I still am, am very protective of who gets to come in. We, we, for a long time, you had to write an essay. Uh, there's an essay portion of your application to, to be allowed to collect me. Um, but it, it is still, it's even tighter than that now. Now there isn't even an application. <laughs> so. you, know, you know, back in my day, no one wanted our NFTs. We couldn't even restrict them by essay or multiple choice question. They didn't want them at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, 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 I waited that out. I wasn't around when you guys were struggling. I came, at the, I came in in the middle of that first major bull run. And, um, you know, I, I, I obviously, I mean, I had the, the business experience and I had the, the, the collectible experience. And I, I, I have something that most, most of my artist peers don't have. And that's a, a, a pretty strong economic background, or a background in economics, right? And so in that regard, I, you know, I, I had some tools that gave me some advantages here, but at the end of the day, I delivered that early growth to the project and made it a hell of a lot of fun. So that, you know, we, there are about, I mean, there are a few thousand that have my pieces, but there's about 600 that have have collected me at times it, it's i i demand a lot of my collectors of the of those who get to buy on primary but right now there's about 200 240 um active participants and 150 of them i everything that i've minted since that 14th day uh is blind so everybody every piece that, that anybody buys from me they don't know what they're getting until they've they've bought it um which is a big part of the, the fun and the reveal uh along all that so so i've got some very very dedicated collectors um and you know we, we've we've held on through this this crypto winter 
to say the, the least. Well, those are definitely all the mechanics that we used to talk about. If even the blind cards, those would be super fun to have the random uh, surprise element of it. Because we talked when we were working on curio cards and stuff in 2017, we talked all about like baseball cards, magic cards, like packs, yeah. boxes, the different ideas about being a collector. And that's what I hear a lot from you is that collector's mentality where I think of the movie High Fidelity. He's like, I'm selling all these singles to these people and I'd feel bad if I wasn't one of them. Right, exactly. Oh, no, that's it. This is built the, most of my demographic for collectors. And, and, and we also do a lot of IRL. So I've met a huge majority of my collectors. They write this this week. I mean, even last night I was out with, I don't know, seven or so people that, that collect my stuff out here in LA. Right. Um, but they're in their 40s. <laughs> they have some stability in their lives and a bit of nostalgia of sorts. Uh, they, they're not into modern baseball cards and the card breaking and the nonsense. And, and, you know, the fact that a, you can pull a hundred thousand dollar Mike Trout right now, which is more than, you know, a Frank Robinson rookie or whatever is sort of not in their mindset. Maybe they don't even care about baseball as much anymore because they've grown out of it or they've got other things in life, but they, they still have, some fond memories of all of that that we were when we were younger. And I think I put that together in a way that it, it sort of bonds us all. And so we, 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 we do say, and I mean it when I say, it, I don't follow baseball anymore. I mean, I was as involved as you can get in baseball and I, I don't follow the game. It, it's a baseball project that is not about baseball. You don't need to know baseball. If you do, and you, it, you people who know baseball can get into it from that realm. But we don't talk about baseball in the grotto. We don't. The game is is not centered around what's actually happening in what we call American baseball, right? In in our world, in threesomes baseball, it's it's literally Roman Catholic cardinals playing against BDSM submissives. Okay, <laughs> the, the the we don't have the Chicago Cubs. We have the subs. Right. Um, and so you have you've got these these mashups in a world where now, you know, because of the franchise era, there's 25 people who play for the subs. And when we are in real life, they're showing up in gimp masks and ball gags and, and the whole bit. So it's not about baseball. Um, it's not about sports. You don't need to know any of it. Half of my collectors are outside of the U.S. And for and a lot of them. We're drawn to it because they'd seen baseball cards in movies or they they, they kind of knew about that and never had a chance to get into it. And now they're into it. And so, you know, I take a lot of the elements of, of what makes me me. And that that does be it's, it's pretty alpha male baseball centric. I mean, I'm like I was I was a professional baseball player. What, what am I going to say? Right. But I'm so far removed from that now that the project is just a, a bunch of, of goofballs that, that, that loves what we do every day. I, I've always thought that whether it's curio cards or, you know, go back to, to early counterparty stuff, spells of Genesis or, or, you know, Bitcoin or stuff like that. Um, I've always felt that that was a community that would love what we're doing if they knew about it. We haven't told many people what we do. We kind of keep it secret, but, but, you know, it's the sort of thing. One, one of our clients, I don't know if you know, if you know of Cornholio, Cornholio the Great, um, he, he's a pretty major uh, counterparty collector. Um, it has a full set of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Cornholio, I'm sorry, but, but full set of spells of Genesis. And he has uh, the, the Nakamoto, uh, the rare Pepe and, and a full Bitcoin and the whole, he's, he's amazing amazing collection and he is one who is he's heavily involved in ours he's the one who brought me in to do the i did faux spells of genesis he asked me to do um some pieces so i did for the first three series over on on counterparty faux spells of genesis and i painted hand painted my, my pieces so those are my three mints uh that are that are on your network for now now that sounds super cool i remember when uh spells of genesis came out i think they were two hundred dollars a card and I was like, that's too expensive. And you know, I didn't have any money. But uh, yeah, right. it didn't go well on that one. Um, but I was reminded a little bit, have you ever seen the TV show The League? 
it's supposed to be about fantasy football, but really it's about friends and these guys right. and the, all these yeah. jokes together. And it reminds me a lot of what you're talking about here with the baseball league, where it's not so yeah, much about the A's or the Tigers or who's getting traded these days. And it's so hard to keep up. And since Moneyball, since they put those numbers after the team, you know, $115 million Yankees versus $30 million A's, like I kind of can't get into it anymore. It doesn't make any sense to me uh, unless yeah. it's a more equal playing field. Uh, but on your on your league, it can be equal. It can be interesting again, and it can also have nostalgia for guys that were into it way back then. Yeah, Ab- absolutely. It really checks a lot of those boxes. And at the, at the end of the day, and you know this, it's not it's not the easiest thing in your forties to to make friends. I mean, we're 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 old. I mean, we we are set in our ways. We 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 you know, and we don't have the time or the energy. And what what a lot of the grotto, the grotto is my collector community. A lot of the grotto ha- has really come to this because. Whatever it is in my project that brought them in, there's somebody out there that, that that brought them in for that same reason. And it really is just, at this point, a great bunch of friends um, who can't wait to see each other when we get together, who can't wait to for the new painting to drop. You know, right now we're in the middle of, of March Madness. So what, what, what I do, a lot of my, my mints, um, I, the, I let the blockchain dictate part of the addition or part of the, the, the production, but I also like chaos. And so what I use for the chaos part of it is, is things that we can't control like college basketball. So the outcome of the college basketball games, okay. Coupled with the interaction of my players through the blockchain to decide what they're burning or what they're keeping or whatever, then dictates how the pieces come out and, and what the addition sizes are and, and the whole bit. And so right now we're, we're, over these three weeks where everything is tied to college basketball. Nobody knows anything in the grotto about college basketball. Nobody follows any teams. Nobody has any, any real thing. And yet we all tune in together to do this. We did it for world cup. We do it last year for basketball. We do these things as a community centered around this, this idea of, of popular sport, but with no real connection to it. And it's just so much fun. I mean, we, we have one of the most fun communities I think out there because of it. And I think this is one of the great ideas with NFTs and internet and Bitcoin, all these things. You can pretend anything you want. You can go out to the park and live action role play with your swords and you're a wizard and a vampire and whatever. And in the same way, it sounds like you can use these existing games, which are everywhere. They're on every TV in in Las Vegas today. And people are going nuts about these games. And you could be in it because it it links up to the wizards or it links up to the sorcerers. I think that's a great way to repurpose culture. And it's a lot of what people talk about with NFTs, but it hasn't really happened yet, where you could have a gun in Quake, and they could have the same gun in Diablo, and you could transfer the gun over. And But the real way it's going to happen is not like a friendly way, because they're trying to do it friendly now amongst games that they own, is in an unfriendly way, where someone comes in and they says, I'm taking all your Diablo assets, and I'm using them for the butt pirate game. And everyone goes crazy. How could you do that? That's so inappropriate. But these Diablo assets did nothing. And it's like, because they're assets, because they're digital assets, and your baseball cards could be taken by a football player and you could start a football game with them. They're digital assets. You can't control them. And the same thing so, with how you watch football. If you're watching football, rooting for the Dragons, no one can stop you from enjoying that football game. At this at this exact moment, as I just said, for March Madness, okay, the pieces that, that they're using is their token that determines that they are in the Midwest bracket, the, set, the 16th seed, okay? The pieces that I created... I appropriated from CCO projects. So they are Moonbirds and X copy grifters and uh, 6529 memes. But I took these existing projects, okay? And because they're CCO, they've released their, their public domain rights on them, okay? I I then take that piece. I've just scrawled over them the painting of the letter S for South and 16 for 16 seed. And then I put that back out there. And I, 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 I'm more than happy to appropriate another artist's digital work. And then without even – that's that's an extreme where I take it and then mint it as my own, right? But I've also taken somebody else's project and I go, I now give it utility in my universe. So if you own that piece, in, okay, I'll, and so I've, I've gone as far as going and buying 100 of those from a different artist and a dead project, right, and then giving them out to my, my players and now saying, if you have this piece, it allows you to do these other things. And that because it's, that, that right there is, is taking the gun from, you know, gun asset from one game and walking it into another. I do that 
pretty often at this point where I will take pieces from somewhere else and say, now it's here. I imbibe it with threesomes utility. Now it's a part of what we do. And then they start collecting those and, and doing that. I see. That. That's a great idea. And I just want more of that. I've always said curio cards could be used in some game. And if you have a set of one through five, it could give you special powers. And the same way, I think Weezer released some NFTs on wax and they weren't popular. I was like, if you could buy up the penny ones and make the penny ones into your, you know, sword exactly. and give them to all your people and suddenly everyone wants the penny ones, you know, Weezer has no idea why that's popular. Uh, but it's a big funny joke for you and for everyone else, you know. I think that's exactly what I did. I I, I, t- I took a, a, a project, a failed project called Goddesses, which were galactic strippers who had been sent out by their like godlike father to populate some new world. It was ridiculous, and they were just poorly drawn, you know, bimbos basically. And I went, I bought a hundred of them for like three dollars a piece okay and then gave them out to my you know had, had a, we spun the wheel and who got and i, I called them girlfriends it's no now the only ones that work are the 100 token ids that i bought you can't go buy one of those other girlfriends or goddesses and now have a girlfriend it's only the ones that i've said work and then i put them out there and if you have them we take the traits that they have and and if you have a you know purple eye trait then you get this thing and well, it's the so moment- because they can't be counterfeited they're on the blockchain it's numbers exactly. x through y are the valid ones everyone knows they're like oh you're trying to pass off a y plus one here get out of here you clown you know yeah. exactly and that that allows us to do it so it's limitless what you can expand in. It, 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 it becomes as long as you can build the university ecosystem where that works. I mean, you're talking about curio cards. If there are, are still curio card collectors out there and haven't quite found that dynamic that we can do, it's certainly the sort of thing where this is built for communities to eventually merge and understand each other and understand the different ecosystems and how they might play into each other. I mean, there's a lot of potential down the road as projects come to understand how to really flush out their own ecosystems, right, and how to make that work, where there's no question that whether it's on Bitcoin or Ethereum or Tezos, that collectors from one community can't interact and engage with the others by imbibing utility between the three, right? Well, and even now, even though it drives me crazy, people are collecting old Satoshis. There's a guy, uh, Adam McBride knows him, and he keeps throwing his Bitcoin back into the random machine, getting another Bitcoin out, looking for a sat that was in the first 100,000, right. whatever. right. Maybe one owned yeah. by Satoshi. Oh, that's the most valuable. And it seems absurd considering the problems that Bitcoin's trying to solve. Um, but people like doing it. It's the internet. You can't stop anyone. If he wants to sort Satoshi's uh, forever or write a program or a script that does it, uh, nothing we can do. You know, he pays his fees. Right. And, and, and they'll do it as long as it makes sense for them to do it. And the, the ecosystem will evolve around that sort of activity happening. And it's not necessarily the word. I mean, it, it becomes a philosophical event, right, of, of which side you're on on things like that. But to me, any usage case for any of this stuff at its core is good for the overall ecosystem. Right. And if it takes somebody, you know, collecting one little Satoshi at a time to, to somehow trigger somebody else's mind to, to figure out a way that that works out for everything else, then great. I'm all for it. Well, and that's what we always said with our blockchain collectibles and curio cards. We're like, if we, you know, we've gotten all the libertarian people, we've gotten all the cypherpunk people, all the money people, uh, we've got them all, right? Uh, how are we going to get more people? And we're like, what about art? What about baseball cards, collectibles, magic cards, uh, things that I was into as a child? And, you know, you can give someone of these and pretty soon they've got a digital wallet and it's got a, a card in there. It's a digital signature and they don't know what they have, but they want 10 more of them. And now all of a sudden they're buying Ethereum or they're buying Tezos and then they're spending it and then they're buying it and they're learning about wallets and they're learning about all these things, which eventually could lead them back to Bitcoin. It doesn't matter to me, do what you want, but there's lots of different things they could learn. And then I think the future is more exciting if more people know more things, just like in the original Internet, not that we were out there telling people like, hey, you got to get on the Internet. Uh, it was just kind of obvious where you're like, oh, I looked up these lyrics. Oh, I looked up this movie. I know who's in this movie now. How do you know that? Well, the Internet. you got to get on it. The same thing. With yeah. The at, at some point, there, there's something I, I do feel that, and I, I felt this for a while that, that that my project is is sort of an easy onboarding into 
in, into the whole thing because it's got such a robust collector community and, and the franchise era where you take people in and you want to make them good players so they, they benefit your team, right? But, it, but it's a very easy transaction in understanding, okay, this is a baseball card. That, that, that in and of itself, I think, becomes an, an easier comprehension point that allows it to then grow into other things. And we've had people come in, they, oh, my buddy, you know, they bring them in. It doesn't really click. It doesn't resonate, but they end up turning that initial $500 into a few thousand. And then that maybe goes into another project and then, but it did bring them in and they got a wallet and they know how to use it. And so I've always felt that it's a, it's a great point to onboard via collectible, right? If it's something that resonates with the group and, 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 and has a bit of an ecosystem behind it. Well, in our, our first ideas with Curio cards, we did some with Philippe. We eventually had uh, card numbers on them, but we did have baseball card borders. Uh, we had some wood borders. We had some kind of 80s borders with the colors, and uh, we went through ideas. I think we even had the mascot on a card there. Uh, but I just wanted to show one more image of your cards. These are the participant cards. I'm not sure if these are officials or not. Uh, but it's Those a- are my uh, it says Gatorade dump, uh, stretch leader, uh, go warm up the pitcher, and a participant in the pizza party. And I like all of these because they've got the old card style and the green jerseys really look like the A's. So uh, very cool stuff, the participant team here. Yeah, that's that's a that's a, a series that, that's come about for those who, who begrudgingly participated in things where they thought, this seems like this isn't my thing. I'm not into World Cup. I'm not into soccer. I guess I'll do it. And they trusted me, and they threw a few of their other cards into the mix, and then they uh, they didn't realize they were getting participant medals. But that's what I gave them. <laughs> Different ways that, that players who are not exactly key to the team but are on the team celebrate. And, and so there's a, there's a series of 10 of those so far. Well, very cool, and I'm a huge fan of your work. It's much more detailed than I thought it would be, and I'm excited uh, for all the possibilities of the future of maybe having these games where you could manage your team, having the the World Series of your baseball league, uh, stuff like that. Where can people that are just learning about it now uh, follow your project? Where's a good place to start? Certainly. So the the best place is is through Twitter to start. And that's threesomes where the E's are threes. T H R three three S O M three S, uh, and and from there you can find our Discord. Um, but the Grotto Discord uh, is just uh, Discord slash Grotto dot gg. Um, but there you go. That's that's me. And uh, we love new players. We love it when new players come along. Um, Quite honestly, you'll be welcomed into Discord immediately, and and we have a, a number of podcasts, weekly podcasts that we do to, to walk people through the nuts and bolts of it. And like I said, the the collector community, the franchise community, is all about teaching people how to collect and what to do. And so, new series, uh, the new season will kick off here at the uh, end of April. Uh, so if you, you know, now's a good time to come in and and become a free agent and see if a team wants to to contract you and you get paid a salary you get to get paid to collect my cards so uh it sounds fantastic i think it's a great idea and uh maybe we can do another interview in like six months or a year see how it's going see how it's uh, developed uh because i just think it's a great idea Uh, you can check out my work at uh, twitter at mad bitcoins uh this is the world crypto network we've been making videos since like 2013 about bitcoin and stuff and if you're a collector out there check out curio cards uh, they're older than crypto punks. Uh, they don't get a lot of press, but they were in 2017. It was kind of a startup project I did with my friends. And we put about 30 different cards out there with different values. And it's really neat. They wrote a wrapper. You can buy them on OpenSea now. Uh, I didn't have to do anything. Uh, it's all been fantastic. Uh, we were, of course, rejected by the market. No one wanted our cards back then. Uh, but it's amazing people want them now and it's great to see projects like yours where artists can take something they love like baseball and baseball cards and then share it with other people using these collector mechanics and using these digital signatures it's really great i I appreciate you having me on it's been fun i i I love talking about the project when somebody gets into it and and sort of connects on that personal level with with, you know there's a lot of us out there that it was a big part of our lives right so I, i it really means a lot to me that you brought me on thomas appreciate it well, thanks so much for being on the show. And until next time, bye-bye. 